Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the Halloween Roundtable. I was wondering if anyone was going to dress up. Uh, no one has. I don't know if that's a good thing or not, but welcome, welcome, welcome. Um, my name is Matthew Baird. To those who are new to the Roundtable, a big welcome to this ever-expanding group. Um, I've been doing social housing recruitment now for 11 years. I set up on my own two and a half years ago with the idea of trying to do things A, differently, um, but B, with a more customer-based focus. Um both in terms of customers as in yourselves, but also customers as in tenants. And I think that over the last two and a half years, we've managed to do that, but it is evolving and adapting all the time, which is brilliant to see. I'm also co-chair of the board for Spring Housing in Birmingham, and obviously the founder of the Social Housing Roundtable, which was set up during, uh, really, I guess, during the first lockdowns when people were struggling to come together to have discussions. And it was a forum where anything and everything could be discussed with an equal voice was basically the idea behind it. And right. now that we're about 70 right. or so, uh, oh, a couple of people just on mute. So let me just go through that. And now that we're 70 or 80 episodes in, I'd like to think that that's exactly what it's become. And I always think we've discussed any, everything and everything and suddenly find that actually there's more to go. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce today's uh, guest speakers. And as I said, if to those who were here just a few seconds before, at first, Neil and I have been connected on LinkedIn for a long, long time, but we hadn't really actually had too many conversations but I think I'd come across each other a bit and then I saw him at the CIH conference in 2022 I think you were panelling a couple of things there I thought at some point I'm going to get you onto a round table and it's taken about 18 months that's fine <laughs> that's as much my fault as your, as your own and from there I think we we realised it's kind of a kinship in terms of actually if we just get back to basics and do the basics right particularly in a difficult time then other things will change as we go on Neil's the corporate performance and planning manager for Orbit until this Friday. <laughs> and then you're moving to SNG Group to become the head of cult, uh, head of customer performance and improvement. I had to write that one down. Um, so I'll leave you to kind of introduce yourself, today's topic and everything that goes with it. But just a big welcome to yourself and to everyone else who's able to join us today. It's lovely to see you here. So Neil, over to you. Brilliant. Cheers. Yeah, just as a, a quick background for myself, kind of worked in and or studied uh, the social housing sector for oh, nearly 15 years now um so uh belie the the youth of my face um in terms of my, my current role yeah i'm ending on friday and moving over to sovereign housing so i've spent basically the last 10 years over at orbit working in various performance and reporting roles um with a few other bits and pieces sprinkled about um key focus at the moment is the tenant satisfaction measures and how we kind of ingratiate them into our broader performance management framework it might be acronym heavy if you don't know what i'm saying don't know what the acronyms are just do the international signal for help which is that and i'll endeavor to actually explain what the hell i'm talking about um if i do speak for too long which is a, a habit of mine matt just play like the oscars music in the background <laughs> have a microphone and we can kind of kick on because i'm I imagine there'll be some good uh, debate off the back of that. So without further ado, we'll do that awkward bit where I try and work out how to share my screen and then we shall crack on. Rightio, has that come through for everyone? Can you see that? Yeah. Rand, yeah, good work, pal. Perfect. So yeah, the, the key what? element here I'm calling is, mm -hmm. is back to basics because um, ba that's kind of where a lot of the Regulators' motivations and focus have been both on the TSMs, but also on the upcoming um, consumer standards as well. So that's kind of the overview. Um, and just as an absolute necessary to pad out the um, presentation, go through a quick run through on what the actual inspection measures are. They are split across two different elements, one which is perception surveys. And then one that is MI, which is our first acronym of the day, which is management information. So it's a combination of what our customers are perceiving of us and the services that we provide, but also hard information related to that. And there's a very deliberate strand between them uh, that will kind of run through very quickly. Um, I will mention consumer standards slightly because they are very relevant whether it's not quite my lane so there'll be references to but not in-depth discussion of um though if anyone has any particular feelings on that please do bring them through because they are all interconnected and we'll kind of run through that uh shortly i think the key things to work through as organizations is understanding where you're going to need to focus your time money and your energy um the, the topics we're going to run through are in alphabetical order, not in priority order, but there's a, a reason for all of them. 
complaints because it starts with C and as my alphabet is a bit old that is you know third in in there so we'll start with that um it is very clear that across the sector we are seeing a significant increase in complaints at the moment the housing ombudsman's latest re uh, annual review highlighted a 323 percent rise in severe maladministration failing so that's your top tier stuff that's thrown through all of the internal complaints process made it to the housing ombudsman and that's kind of hitting their main grading for for smack bottoms all around so that's huge i mean it's 31 to 100, 131 um findings but that, that's a massive increase uh house mark uh, of a benchmarking groups are available uh, have noted a 78 percent increase in stage one complaints being reported through its benchmarking clubs so you're seeing all the way through the process complaints are massively increasing there'll be a number of reasons for that significantly around um we've had a couple of campaigns from uh dlook to highlight the ability for um customers to make complaints we've had upgrades to the housing ombudsman code that kind of flown through uh, and improvements in processes as well that kind of went through last year so you are seeing a lot of pushes towards complaints happening but i think fundamentally they're happening because our services aren't as good as they could or should be and that's the key thing to think about when going through um what they are looking at again will flow through in terms of the the uh, presentation shortly is predominantly on property condition, which is a bit of a confusing one. It's a catch-all term, but it accounts for the condition of properties our customers are living in, but also repairs services and plan maintenance services as well. So it's a bit of a catch-all term, but that is where the main focus, well, the main category of complaints that are flowing through into the, uh, the housing ombudsman are. So it makes sense from the point of view of housing organisations when looking at the tenant satisfaction measures to have that key area, particularly because you're seeing a lot more complaint handling failure orders coming through, I think 146 last year, which is a significant increase on previous years. So the regulator is keen and the housing ombudsman are keen for this to be a focus for you because we're getting more complaints coming through. We're not necessarily handling them in the way that they should be handled. And we'll see that in terms of uh, both the perception surveys you come through. If you look on the left hand side of the screen, you've got both the perception related uh, complaints measures and then the hard measures as well in terms of complaints relative to, to the size of the landlord and complaints responded to within time scales. Some pretty keen measures there. You'll notice when we go through that the last couple of items are the same on each of these slides, which is use of data systems and what you're doing to improve things. That is a central point to the TSMs, and we'll go through this more and more, is that the regulator is not expecting you to be perfect. Far from it. There's a reason why we're here. What it expects you to be able to do is to demonstrate you're using the data and systems available to you and the information that you have to improve things and how you're going about that. That's what they want to see. They very deliberately step back from doing a highly prescriptive approach to handling the uh, regulation and to the enhanced requirements following the changes coming through. But there is an expectation for you to decide to demonstrate learning and to demonstrate improvements off the back of the information that you have. So if we move through, repairs is the next one. And this is you know, obvious from all the information that we're seeing at the moment in terms of where complaints are coming through from, in terms of what you're seeing almost weekly on the both the housing press, but also the non-housing press in terms of failures of repair services, failures to go out and do what our customers are asking us to do, particularly on damp and mould has been a key one over, over the last year or two following the, the, the death of Abishak over at Rochdale Bar Homes. It is a big one to get right. Um, we are seeing significant pressures of the sector on repair services. Post-COVID backlog hasn't helped, but actually we're also seeing an aging housing stock, lack of investment in, in upgrading the condition of that stock coming through to bite us. Because the less you spend on your proactive spend, the more you're going to spend on reactive. And we're seeing that through some of our stresses. If you've been into any of the engagement sessions with Kate Dodsworth, who is now the director of consumer regulation, but I could be incorrect, you'll notice that the key theme of that is it's about repairs, stupid. It is a massive focus because it is a massive failing. For most organisations, this is the key area of contact with customers, and we're just simply not getting it right. So using the TSMs to help realign focus onto your repair service and to build out your performance management framework related to that is going to be key. And again, it's around what data do you have? How are you using it? Are your systems up, 
up to, to scratch in terms of providing you with the information that you need, because I can guarantee for a number of organisations, they're not. Um, what are you doing to improve things? I think for a lot of organisations historically, there has been a culture of blame avoidance and lack of accountability and transparency where measures go wrong. And there's been an emphasis on figures as opposed to outcomes. That is problematic when you're looking to drive change and to improve things from the point of view of the customer, because you spend more time looking at what do we include or exclude for the point of view of a measure, as opposed to what we should be doing, which is actually improving the services that we're providing. And again, that's the whole point of the back to basics here. You know, very John Major-esque, hopefully with a better outcome, but you know, it's why we it's why it's the focus of this is around going back to the core of who we are as organizations and what we need to deliver for our customers. Tied to repairs heavily is the quality of our stock and the condition of our stock. We as a country, and speaking specifically of England here, because obviously housing is a deregulated uh, or devolved even, it's definitely not deregulated, it's a devolved uh, policy area. Um, the bulk of our housing stock, the peak of when we built, was 19 is in the 1960s. We had a little bit of renaissance in the in the early 1970s, but the vast majority of our stock is pre-1970 in terms of new builds that are flowing through. Okay. So we have an aging stock. We have some of the oldest housing stock in Europe. Um did help that not all of it got flattened in the kind of 1939 to 45 period, but there are other legacy factors as to why our stock is much older than our kind of contemporaries on, on the continent. That, particularly for social housing, is an issue because we are seeing more and more money having to go in to maintain the quality of our stock at a time when budgets were squeezed, and naturally something has to give. Anyone who, like myself, involved in the SDR would have noticed that there have been some tweaks in the questions that they're asking specifically on DHS. So it's where have you failed? What category have you failed? And actually, when was the last time you did your surveys? Um, that is not a coincidence. Um, interestingly, none of that information was made available in the housing stats release, which came out uh, a week ago, um, which... It was odd to me because they they delivered everything else from the SDR. But the fact that the regulator is very specifically asking that question of registered providers as part of the SDR, so a requirement, a regulator return, shows the level of interest that they have. I suspect they don't believe some of the figures that we're providing on DHS. And they are using this as a way to wedge open and go to organisations to ask more awkward questions as to, do you actually know the quality of your stock? If you look at the items from the Better Social Housing Review, um, the joint uh, review sponsored by CIH and NatFed, going out and doing more regular inspections was a key element of getting you know, better information. Far too many organisations clone surveys, far too many organisations rely on third parties to give them information about their stock. You're building multi-million pound, multi-year uh, investment programmes off the back of you know, missing information and assumed information. That's just simply not a place that we can afford to be anymore. So again, this is a big area of concern. If you know anyone who's RICS qualified, they are going to be in the money because chart surveyors are worth their weight in gold at the moment because everyone's going to be doing the same thing in terms of getting out and wanting to see their stock. So a bit of free advice there, get get your job, um, app, well, job applications in, get your job adverts out for that because there's going to be a, a massive scramble for resource in that. So that's kind of the situation as is and some pointers from me in terms of where you probably want to uh, look uh, as individual organisations, if you're not already. How do we actually action that? What do we need to do to uh, prepare? I use Brave New World kind of a bit tongue in cheek here because, frankly, this isn't a Brave New World. This is what we should be doing anyway. Um, but in terms of how we can properly bring in the TSMs into the day to day management of organisations, because I guarantee you, there will be some organizations that just have this as standalone metrics that are reported maybe quarterly and then for the final push at the year end, but aren't properly taken in to the heart of the performance management framework. If you do that, you'll come a proper. It's not a tick box exercise. What the regulator is looking for, yes, is the figures produced at the end of the year, but it's wanting proper assurance from board level down that you are using this to improve the services to your customers, that you are listening to your customers, to your tenants, to your residents, whichever terminology you want to use. It is not an excuse simply to produce these and then forget about them. You have to demonstrate learning, particularly when it comes to the perception surveys. You've got a massive qualitative information there from which you can drive through. 
So getting off my pedestal and lecture a little bit, in terms of how we practically apply this, there are a few things that I would strongly advise you doing. Using a strategy map to expressly tie your existing performance management uh, measures into the TSMs will give you a very clear understanding of where you are. The TSMs are infrequent. They are quarterly to, well, you produce them yearly, but you should really be going through quarterly in terms of collecting for your perception surveys just to give you time to get through the numbers for until the end of the year. But what you can create is a league and a lag measure connection and an understanding of which parts move to improve those items. Because again, it's around what do we need to look at to understand where services are, what do I need to improve? Strategy map is a great tool to be able to do that. And you can do it in multi-layers. So you can do it between the TSMs and your top tier performance management framework. So stuff that goes to your executive teams, to your leadership teams, to your boards. And then you can break that down further to your interdepartmental stuff and your interdirectorate stuff. It's a lot of work, but it's worth it because you can start to build up the links from the ground upwards into where you need to drive through performance. Doing a gap analysis is incredibly important on this. Yes, this is basic stuff, but it doesn't necessarily mean that you're doing it and doing it in a way that can actually help you move things forward, taking from your management information through to the TSMs. The regulator has been quite clear in terms of the definition that's provided for the TSMs, but is also acknowledged there's a little bit of wiggle room there because not organization operates the same. So you just need to ensure that the way that you're reporting stuff matches what the TSMs are, but that actually when you're tracking it back through to your management information, those other interrelated metrics are worth the paper they're written on in terms of feeding through. Um, so very important one there. The next one is we're in that sweet spot at the moment. We've had two quarters of information flow through. You know, I've got two quarters to the end of the year, a little bit less than that because we're basically in November now. So you have a sweet spot in, in terms of report development to flesh out anything that you need to flesh out from a management information point of view to help improve where, you, where you're at. This is where we're talking about consumer standards now. So again, once the regulator hasn't said that it wants to be prescriptive in terms of its approach, it has set out some pretty darn clear expectations on the consumer standards and it has done that per standard, it has done that per subcategory of standard. So what you'll need to do there, and this is where we kind of have the, the Holy Trinity, not so much the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit, but certainly a triangulation of items is reviewing your policies to make sure that what you're looking and saying that you're doing as an organization marries to the expectations and there's no breaches there in terms of the consumer standards. But then how are you monitoring the effectiveness of those policies? Do you have metrics assigned to your policies? I mean, there'll be a few that won't necessarily be an easy one to do, but having that then tied flow through and back into your management information up to the um, TSMs is incredibly important because what you say you should be doing what you're actually doing as an organization might not necessarily be the same thing. And you won't know that unless you have the appropriate checks and balances in place in terms of management information on top of those policies that should adhere to the consumer standard expectations. So again, do your gap analysis, see where you actually are as opposed to where you think you are and move forward from there. And then the last point, which is a general point across the organization, is your reporting in your system to data good enough? I can guarantee it probably isn't. Um, now that will be on a continuum. Some of it will just be you need some better processes in place. Others, you're going to need a new system. It's fine to be in that situation at the moment. The, the regulator isn't expecting perfection. It is, it is expecting openness and transparency. So where you have failings, where you have shortcomings, is about understanding what they are and developing a roadmap to rectify them. If that means you need to junk your housing management system and get a new one, so be it. If it means you need to build out your reporting, so you have a central reporting team that delivers out for the organization as opposed to people hiring off their own little Excel-based uh, reports in, in the back corner somewhere, fine, do it. But you need to be doing that ASAP Rocky. Otherwise, you're going to be in a bit of an issue. Um, so yeah, they're kind of key things here. I'll try and move forward because I've still got another five slides and I do talk a lot, so we'll crack through. What does this look like? Going back to the beginning, this is performance information to drive change. You now have a wealth of information that will be coming to you, you should have had it before, but that's by the by, in order for you to be able to look at where you're wanting to improve your services. And you do that by triangulating uh, three key areas, which is your complaints information, your surveys, both perception and transactional, and then your management information. I can guarantee you, if your management information isn't read, but your surveys and complaints are telling you that you're dog shy, you're either 
haven't got a report that's worth the paper that it's written on, or you've massively screwed in terms of how you define the metric, because those should be in alignment. If you are having low satisfaction, you should have high volumes of complaints. If you're having good measures, you should be having good satisfaction and good complaints, or you should be having an honest picture in terms of your management information is read, your survey responses are showing poor satisfaction and your complaints are high, okay? They should triangulate. If they aren't, something's amiss there and you need to work out what it is, PDQ. On the flip side, you're just reinforcing the point from the consumer standard stuff. You will need to make sure that you're behaving and operating in the way that the regulator expects you to. So on the consumer standard side, that gives you, I mean, it's, it's brilliant because what the regulator has done is given you a blueprint of how to operate your organization. And it's given you a blueprint of how to manage that information and how to target what you should be looking at. It doesn't cover everything because obviously there's no arrears information, there's no void days of information, and there's no value for money or your financial metrics in these elements, although the, the value for the money metrics are obviously reported yearly, and that is another regulator requirement. But you have the basis, the building blocks for a very coherent performance management framework there, which if you aren't already, you should be aligning and refocusing on for, for, the, for the next financial year above and beyond. But you've got very clear two elements there that you can work through um, to give you a very clear understanding of, of how your organization is doing. And again, it's just about understanding where you are and moving forward and improving. That's the key thing. It's not about perfection at this stage. So just to re-emphasize the point, with risk comes opportunity, with regulation comes oversight. But again, it gives you an ability to have a look afresh. And as someone who's worked in performance for a significant period of time, what you'd like to look at and how you'd like to report it doesn't necessarily align with the more senior management in the organization. That's fine. It is what it is. But this gives you an opportunity to really drive through on some of those core metrics and actually put your foot down. Gives you that opportunity to revisit and review performance management framework. Are we looking at what we should look at? You know, Do we need to rebalance the scorecard? Are we too skewed on the financials? Are we too skewed on new builds, for example? Or do we actually have a proper 360 view? <coughs> of our organization uh, and what and the services that we're delivering to our, our customers. <clears throat> you now have your top tier lagging measures from which you can build out your all, all of your, your key metrics. So yes, you'll see these come through and flow through during the year, but you've got loads of information that feeds into that. So how, how are you gonna use that is gonna be crucial in terms of moving things forward. We now have regulatory back benchmarking. I know the regulator said, oh, we're not gonna create a a table out of this on guarantee inside housing will. Um, but for yourself, what you'll have is an ability to see where you truly are as an organization with metrics that are more stick than carrot in terms of making sure people deliver. Again, you've got Housemark, you've got Vanguard, you've got these benchmarking um, organization out there. They rely on the carrot. And with the carrot comes leeway to kind of cut the pie in a particular way. If you go through to an X4 of the tenant satisfaction measures, which has been my Bible for the last few months, you'll see very, very clearly how items should be calculated and how they should be delivered. If you're thinking to try and get around that, to tweak it a little bit, to make yourselves look a bit better, hand in your resignation, because you'll be found out, you'll be found out very quickly. A bit like in your intermediate GCSE back in 2006, you've got to show you're working. And it's going to be very, very easy for the regulator to look at the published information that you provided through your, your annual corporate report and through your annual, annual customer report and cross-reference that against what you're, you're doing here. It would be the first thing I'll be doing to look at organisations and seeing where their performance benchmark is. Because if you've suddenly had a massive improvement in, say, customer satisfaction or in repairs delivery, and it simply doesn't match the previous submissions that you've done on your customer report brand reports, you're going to be asking why, and it'll be quite easy to find out. So use it as a proper statement for you. Use it as an understanding of where you are and move forward. But it does give you an ability to see where other organizations are and get you a better understanding. Um, moving through tie this this is a crucial point everything's crucial but this is really important tie it to your improvement programs if your improvement programs are completely dislocated from your performance information and from the tsms you've got a problem there'll be elements that you have to do anyway because of you know changing business requirements and all of that but there should be a clear and direct line between what the information is saying and what you're looking to improve 
that's the crucial piece here. Because again, it's not about being perfect, it's about making sure you're moving forward and improving on your current position. So having that, if you've got a director of transformation and change, if you've got a PMO team, buy them cake, buy them biscuits, buy them whatever you need to do to get them on board because they're going to be your BFFs for the next few years because they're going to deliver the real value for this because it'll be taking the actual insight delivered from perception surveys from transaction surveys and free management information and improving services accordingly. It's a real, real crucial point. So how does that look like? How do we embed this in? Well, th this is very rough. Every organization is different in terms of how it approaches things. We've got multiple different types of group structures. So this is quite generic in terms of approach. But as you'll see, things all interconnect. You've got lots of arrows going in two directions, and that's very deliberate. Your key priorities could potentially be your TSMs, but we've all got corporate plans. We love being a bit Chairman Mao-esque um, in terms of having five-year plans for how we move things forward. They sit at your top. You can build in the TSMs to their flow through should be, I'll call it balance scorecard there, but that's all your governance reporting. So again, what goes to your executive team, to your leadership teams, to your boards, should all be tied through. Your key learning should be informed by your scorecards. Your scorecards should be informed, your key learning. Same for TSMs and your change management. That has to then be tied into your financial plan because if you ain't got cash to do it, you've got to make a decision on what you prioritise to deliver each year. It's all interrelated and that's the key point here. Lots of key points, lots of crucial points. You cannot operate in isolation. Everything has to flow through. Everything has to be tied in because, again, that's how you move everything forward. Last slide, you'll be very pleased to hear, and then, then I'll shut up for a little bit. Get used to your information being publicly available. We are required to report a load of stuff anyway. We're just having real kind of coherency in terms of how different organisations provide it because you can cut a pie a particular way and certainly I've had experience in the past uh, of individuals wanting to push particular metrics because it make, makes them look better as opposed to having this standard suite of metrics that go through. Invite customers in. The consumer standards are very, very clear in terms of requirements for engaging customers and frankly you should be doing it anyway. No one knows the services delivered better than your customers who are on the receiving end of it. Having that information through that merry go golden nuggets of information, that should be part and parcel of what you do as an organisation. So it's not just a, re a regulatory requirement, it's good practice. So get customers involved, allow them to tear you apart, allow them to build you back up constructively, because these are ultimately are the people whose lives you have a disproportionate impact on. So listen to them. Next, embrace this transparency. Sunlight is the best disinfectant. You'll be able to move through and move, well, you'll be able to move mountains, to be honest, by having this stuff out in the open because nobody wants the wooden spoon. No one wants to be in a position where they are the worst performing registered provider. And there will be someone because there will always be someone at the bottom. Move it forward. Use this to kind of ask yourself the awkward questions. Why have we got to this position? What do we need to do to improve? What do we need to refocus on to deliver? So embrace that transparency. It is a good thing. You should have been doing it anyway, but that is by the by. The final point heavily tied to that, change your performance culture. Because again, I can guarantee there would have been conversations happening at senior level where the focus was on how are we measuring this as opposed to what do we need to do to improve this? Um, make sure when you're getting information through from your, your SMEs and your organisation, you're properly understanding why you are at the position that you're at. Any idiot can say this number goes up, this number goes down, this little piggy goes to market. Now, anyone can do that. I can see that. I've got eyes. What you're wanting to be able to do is understanding the reasons behind that and draw that out. And that is a performance culture element because it means people holding up their hands and saying, we stuffed up, we under-resourced this particular area, or market conditions have got away with us, so things are costing us a lot more than we expected, so we've had to rein in budget spend elsewhere. That is fine. That is perfectly acceptable as a response but then difficult decisions have to be made of okay well how do we align how do we rein back in budgets and how do we spend the smaller amount of cash that we've got available because of all external factors but again that is that comes from a culture where it is okay to fail it comes from a culture where it's okay to have a measure that's in the red a performance metric being in the red isn't bad ignoring it or trying to change the metric so it goes green where actually resolving the underlying issues is where you have problems but that is all culture piece, and that is top down. That is one of the few things where you have to have your chief exec and your leadership team and your executive team 
driving that through and saying, no, we will hold our hands up, we will own this, and we will move forward in a constructive measure, because otherwise you're, you're pissing in the wind a little bit. And that, my friend, <laughs> I'll go to the very next slide, is the last one. So I will shut up and I'll hand no, it back. I, I don't think you will, because there's questions for you. But yeah. <laughs> but I do want to kind of say, firstly, like a big thank you for, for that. I think it was it's such a big topic, and to try and whistle-stop it and then have discussion afterwards is always difficult in an hour. So thank you for it. And, and I think more importantly, that last point you made is going to be absolutely key over the next year. And it came up on the round table last week, which is there are businesses that are almost going to try and hide or adapt or twist their metrics. So that it looks like they're being more successful than they are. And the only people you're failing then are your tenants. And if you're actually going to improve, then this is the only way you're going to do it. So I, I'm really glad that you, you raised that at the end there. A few questions that have come through from the chat. And again, thank you for, for bringing it all to the table. So uh, Tony said, don't, uh, don't we have to do surveys for compliance purposes anyway? No, it's best practice, it's best guidance, but the STAR surveys haven't been a regulated requirement for a few years. They are basically the starting point for the, the new requirements, uh, but yeah, that was quietly dropped a few a few years ago. And this is part of the, I think, the ongoing problem, and, and, and as you said, a lot of it is, is culture. A question from Sophie Hayward. In terms of carrying out more regular, ex, more regular inspections of existing stock, do you know what the RSH will intend to do where RPs don't implement improvements or enough improvements to stock. Time and time again, we always say there isn't enough money to upgrade or update existing stock. Yeah, good question. Um, I think, and this is coming, you know, second hand for me, is it's not anything about direct conversations with the regulator and our besties, but there is an, accept, an acceptance that you'll try and improve and look to do the best within your budgetary constraints. As long as you're ensuring desire and improvement to move forward, I think that will be taken on in good faith. Where you lie, try and hide things to avoid responsibility and accountability, that's where it's going to be smack bottoms all around. But you're right, it's, it's incredibly challenging. At the moment, we have net zero carbon. We have retrofits across the stock. We have, as I mentioned earlier, one of the oldest housing stocks in, in all of Europe. Um, we are having to rein back in on our capital programs. We're having to rein back in on new builds because you know we're having to pump more and more grant into a smaller number of units just to get them off the ground because of how costs are increasing. So as long as there's clear and consistent assurance from board and demonstration of business decisions being made in the best interest of our customers, I think that's perfectly acceptable. But yeah, it's, uh, you're not in a great position in terms of cash-wise for the sector, regardless of what some might think. I think it goes back to that that point you made very early on, which is that it isn't they're not expecting everyone to come out all green. In fact, we're mm. definitely not expecting that. But it's a case of, OK, well, this is what we're doing to, to change and adapt. And, you know, it is going to be a shocking year. I think when the results come out, it could be, you know, it's, it's going to be this big moment. But equally, I don't think anyone, if they're honest, is going to be too surprised at what comes out. I think we all know it's going to come out and look like a bit of a car crash. But that we need to improve and and if there are those that are kind of those outlying ones that are really performing brilliantly again that's where i think actually the regulator is going to double down on those as well and go why and actually is it as good as you're as you're portraying um question from leslie channon the regulator has said you need to trust your data what stock condition your housing stock in and also who's living behind the door all of the end data etc a really good point and i think that's going to be a, a, a discussion probably for you know for further down the line maybe but this idea that it isn't just in terms of how good is the stock, it's your entire service delivery, I think is going to be key. But also, and I think this came up last week, don't just hold E&D data for the sake of it. If you've got data, it's, you have to do something with it. Yeah, I know. I can see Claire Patterson on the call. She will back up <laughs> 100%. Um, you, you've seen it with the, the housing ombudsman as well, where they're noting significant failures in the part of housing associations, registered providers, RSLs, whatever you want to bloody call them, um, where there have been specific vulnerabilities uh, for customers who weren't accounted for and that has exacerbated the complaints so yeah it, just as much as we need to understand our stock condition better uh, Leslie's absolutely right we have to understand who's behind the door and their specific needs and that is both on the housing ombudsman side and the regulator side as well they're pushing that very heavily when I had that when I was actually uh, interviewing the ombudsman as uh, well chairing the panel for the ombudsman at the CIH Southwest Conference one thing that's stuck with me ever since, a, apart from being like, what am I doing here? But that's by the by, um, was they said, all we can really do is show a mirror. That's all we can do. We can just show a mirror to what you are doing and what you aren't. And if there's stuff there, like the mirror will, will show it up. But so just don't hide it. 
is, is yes. kind of one of the key things. And also be aware of actually maybe why some of the decisions are being made the way they are. I'll come to Leslie in just a second. There was a question from Jack Madge in the, in the chat. For some smaller housing providers, there might not be a designated performance manager or lead. So those managers lead reviewing policies and procedures and bridging the gap to ensure there's a performance management framework in place. What are your three key takeaways which you suggest to ensure they're getting this right? And this is really, really interesting, actually, because as I mentioned right at the beginning, I'm a recruiter. That's what I do. This yeah. stays free because a lot of you have used me for your recruitment. But if you want to keep doing it, then brilliant. The longer it can keep running. And actually, uh, Ellie, who's on the call to, with me today, actually, you know, there was a role which had come up. And she suggested me to a client. And what they were looking for was someone to go in and review the complaints procedure, not in terms of being a head of complaints, nothing like that, but come in and go, actually, can someone just get a hold of this and work out what we're doing wrong? And it seems like this is exactly that same thing. It's just policy, you know, your performance managers, your leaders, your consultants, whoever they are, for three takeaways, that's a really tough question. But if you've got anything you can advise, Neil, that'd be amazing. Well, it takes me back to my, my first official role in the housing sector was a business improvement and communications officer. So on the one day I was looking at service improvement, the other day I was writing the staff newsletter, which was a, you know, a, a bit of a weird one to get your head around. But it, it's symptomatic of you know smaller organisations. It is tough. I would argue that you'd need executive team sponsorship and ownership. So your chief exec, your deputy chief exec should be leading on that because frankly, they're paid enough and they should be smart enough and bright enough to be able to lead on there. Um, lean on the learning that's being provided by the housing ombudsman, by the regulator. Look at what's coming out from the CIH and their policy team. Get yourself tied into policy groups who, who are sharing best practice, both at the Fed and both at the CIH. That will help. You are only going to have finite resources as a smaller organization. There are reduced expectations in terms of delivery for the TSMs for uh, registered providers who have smaller units of stock. The kind of threshold is a uh, thousand units on the LCRA or the LCHO element for kind of full provision. But put your hand up, engage early. If you feel like you've got a breach, if you feel like you have an issue, self report and just hold your hands up. But in terms of practical stuff, I would be looking to the senior management team of those organisations to lead, because frankly, everyone else is going to be too busy just keeping their lights on in the organisation. So not necessarily three takeaways, but uh, hopefully some helpful points there. Thank you very much. Leslie, I'm going to bring you in before going to Sabani's point in the chat. Leslie, good to have you with us. Oh, hello. Hi, Neil. Hey. <laughs> um, so I just wanted to go off the back of um, my comment that the regulator has said um uh oh i have tried to start my video okay that's right you're back <laughs> sorry right, right um so the regulator has said that you need to really be aware of stock condition of your properties and i know that's a lot of um uh you know issues around repairs getting repairs done right first time but then also um you know trusting the quality data that you have and that that is like an absolute key thing um and that does change over time. I just did a big, um, huge uh, uh, consultancy work with an organization um, and over 1,300 tenants responded. 40% of them are identifying as having invisible um, disabilities and that is not reflected um, within the data that the organization holds. So I know a lot of people are freaked out about GDPR, but there are ways to, um, be able to get the buy-in if you communicate um, clearly of why you are wanting to get the information and hold the data and what you're going to do with it. So that's just what I wanted to add. Um, and that they said that, um, you know, the kind of trusting the data was data, data, data. That's all she was plugging. The other thing was that with regards to best practice, that they are not going to be holding up organizations as best practice examples because the next day they might be not compliant in something else and then um so obviously like neil said places like cih natfed will probably highlight and inside housing will, will will probably highlight the ones that are doing um some best practice um uh, examples in certain areas thank you leslie uh neil anything to add to that no just very valid points i think the main issue that we uh, organizations have had with uh kind of vulnerability data disability data how you'd like to call it is actually maintaining it most will do big censuses and they'll do it once every 10 years or so and it's actually the day-to-day -day management of that and upgrading it and actually getting beyond the the, the kind of tenant lead tenant situation i know certainly at orbit it's been something we've been 
working hard on to get right and you know not not necessarily always do um, but it tends to be your day-to-day management on customer information that's problematic because we don't have those systems as processes and places to make sure it's updated people don't tell us when they have kids they don't have to but it's kind of helpful to know from an overcrowding point of view if your situation changes and for example you develop ms you're going to be in a very different uh, housing requirement situation from where you were is quite quite healthy so it's those day-to-day changes that can really kind of come a cropper for housing organizations but it's it's crucial to get it right but i guess that also comes down to how strong your relationship is with your housing officer and with your housing provider and i think this this is where that idea of culture that you've mentioned and it's probably the word that i would say has been the word of the year this year on the round table because if you're if you have a culture where your tenants truly believe you care Mm. then they will come to you when there are significant changes in their lives if they don't think you do why would they bother telling you there's a point from Sabani in the chat, very interesting and well-presented issues around the TSMs, Neil. I'd be interested to know the appetite you have seen within HAs to make the use, to make use of the data more proactively rather than react rather than reactive quarterly or whatever frequency of board reporting they may have. And I, I, I appreciate we've also got Claire on the, <laughs> probably itching with her finger here to come in on this one. But Neil, I'll let you uh, talk and then I'll bring Claire in. Yeah, I, th- I think the appetite honestly, it's generally been there. It's the execution that has proved problematic. You have a lot of organisations. I mean, if you look at registered providers as a whole, we are SMEs, so small to medium enterprises. That gives us restrictions in terms of cash available and knowledge and skills and expertise to move forward with the times. You know, a lot of organisations are talking about data warehouses. Data warehouses is old data lake house now that the stuff has moved on and how you ingest information populate it into reports and push it out is moving forward all the time anyone who's used power bi there are monthly updates to keep you know you ticking over to understand um i think historically for organizations they have thrown resource as in literal people at this stuff and you still have people doing a lot of manual reporting to get it out um because that's just where they are and they haven't been able to put in the capital investment to drive that forward. I think that is really going to show over the next couple of years. And I think some of the bigger, more egregious breaches will be where organisations have been found to be using very manual reporting and not necessarily being able to understand and use their data in a way that should be moved forward. You should categorically not be running a multi-million pound business off spreadsheets for reporting. That is not how it should be worked. Spreadsheet is great for doing some data analysis. It is not a database. A lot of people are using it as that. It is not a primary reporting tool. A lot of people are using it for that. So I think there is an appetite. I think a lot of it just comes down to capacity, capability, and, you know, technological um, I think there's always been that appetite for data. I think part of it is the fact that we've probably had too much. Claire, I'm going to bring you in, then I'm going to go to Savani because actually on that as well, I mean, Yasmina put in the chat there, asset management teams working in silo, information not shared with business areas. This isn't a new part of the conversation, but TSMs, I think, are really going to highlight this. Claire, over to you. Um, thanks, Matt. Yeah, like um, you and uh, Neil have said, I was itching <laughs> to get in there when you started talking about EDI data, especially, but d- data. Um, and as Leslie says, quite rightly, that the GDPR does not stop you lawfully collecting all sorts of data for all sorts of different purposes. But there are certain things you need to put in place. There are loads of things you need to put in place first. And it, it can't be we'll collect the data and then see what we're going to do about it. It's too much to go into here, so I'm gonna if I'm gonna give you one one thing to to remember, and I will um, send Matt a link to um, my EDI meet privacy article if that's okay for you to share later, because um, I explain what those things are that you've got to have in place first. But my one thing is purpose. I say start with purpose, and to put it not as nicely my challenge is always so what we want to collect this data so what what are you going to do about it and as Neil's quite rightly said with the TSMs there's no point just collecting this data it's so what are you going to do about it and that's got to be planned out as much as possible before we actually start collecting any data whether it's the TSMs or it's EDI data it's anything else so what are we going to do about it so that's my challenge today (laughs) I'm always here to challenge (laughs) You are, that's my challenge today <laughs> you are and you're always very very welcome bringing you know i think this is always the point isn't it is there's so many things that we talk about in housing that comes back to data and it seems to come up every week but yeah there's that mix of data and culture being the two key things at the moment and if you 
if the culture of the business isn't tenant first then you're not collecting the data for for any real reason at all and for the right and, purposes yeah a, absolutely. absolutely there's a Man. point from go on please do I sorry, mean, sorry. If I'm, I was, I was desperately looking and trying to see where the raised hand is. <laughs> so no worries. I, I couldn't. So, absolutely agree with Claire saying, and I don't think I have framed the question the way. But what I wanted to say was not to have an impact on your TSM. You cannot see the stock condition in silo, right? So you got to see. And Leslie touched on it. Who is behind the door? Some stock conditions affect disabled people in a different way to normal people, right? So there is a there is a sense of, and as we were talking, you could see the different elements of the data, again, going back to Claire, purposeful, relevant data that increase your TSM and how you're, you are responding to your customers. And that is that's that was my question. It's about, not about, and thanks Neil for pointing that the appetite is always there, but you know, Definitely throwing resources is not the answer. Again, going back, Claire, purpose. Yeah, You're not just creating Power BI, wonderful pictures of dashboards or, you know, creating a data warehouse. What does it solve? What does it do? What does it align with? HAs have so much data that they could actually utilize. But I think that is where um, there is probably with all of these conversations, I think it's only going to help them think in the right way. Uh, uh, so, yes, I just I I got as long your... as we're honest, actually, about what we're saying and what comes through and how honest we are with ourselves. And I think that'll be the thing exactly. that the next few years really starts to really starts to showcase. Thank you, Sabani. There's a you. point from Ash in the chat. I would be keen to hear on the methods of collecting, maintaining customer information. Also, we are a local authority. Has anyone else had any issues in housing getting wrapped up in other council services? Satisfaction may be skewed by other issues, i.e. bins and pot, pot, potholes. And George has said we've had this at Weber Mid, Suffolk District Councils. We just did a piece of work to match our recorded complaints and our TSM complaints information. After speaking with our tenants, we waived anonymity so we could contact them about their answers, we found a small proportion was about non-housing services, but a large proportion was a service request. Have you seen this in terms of any, because I know with Orbit, you work across kind of multiple uh, local authorities. Have you found this yourself, Neil? Um, I can't really speak from a local authority point of view, but I can certainly speak from a survey bleed point of view. It's part of the white noise that you'll get with your survey results. And it happens whether it's a transactional survey, whether it's a perception-based survey. You just have to accept the fact. It's why you do uh, confidence interval checks on your data. And you kind of accept the fact that there's going to be a 2 to 3% swing either way in, in, in terms of where stuff lies. Surveys are not an exact science, but they are a solid methodology. And what you should be focusing on is what are the key things coming out from a qualitative point of view? So what are the key trends? What are people talking about? Yes, when you go out and say, how how's the groundskeeping in your local area? They're like, well, the, the, the potholes on the, the A46 are awful, sort them out. Now, that's not really us, but okay, fair enough. You will still have enough data in there to make a positive impact on the services you're providing but there will always be white noise and frankly people will use any opportunity that they can to raise issues that are important to them regardless of whether or not it's specifically related to the question that you're asking that's that's just the nature of surveys unfortunately it is uh, it's a question from sophie hayward in terms of carrying out more regular inspections of existing stock do you know what the RSH will intend to do where RPs don't implement? Oh, hang, we've had that one. That was from earlier. Apologies. It's come right down my chat, I think, because somebody responded to it. My Entirely my fault there. Um, so the, a lot of comments around kind of death by survey. Now the RSH are wanting to conduct their own surveys. A lot a lot kind of coming on with this, with this survey side of things. I'm going to bring Leslie in in just 10 seconds, but I think this whole thing with, with TSMs and performance-related work at the moment, it comes down to stupidly the the fact that this is being enforced i think probably says an awful lot about the sector as a whole you know this should never have been needed but it's got so bad and i know there's been a lot of pressures i know there's a lot of services as i put up on on linkedin last week people in housing should be incredibly proud and not give up and we've lost so many people from the sector who've worked in it and now gone off to do other things but on the other side of it and i i, I missed who put it in the chat there was definitely a, a point that was made which was we just need to go back to listening to our frontline staff again. You know, go back to actually going, you know, and we've got Yasmin Mahmood in the chat today who, who has raised this point on a number of occasions. If we go back and actually listen to what 
our housing officers, our housing managers are saying and get chief executives to really kind of go, well, what's it like day to day out there? What's it like for our multi-skilled operatives going into these places? Mm. That's the information you need if you're going to make change. And Neil, I know you and I have had the, this chat before as well. Yes, it's, I mean, Warsaw Housing Group have just announced they're going back to 500 to 700 unit patches. I remember when I was doing my my master's, don't you know, um, in housing <laughs> policy and practice, that was the day rigor. That's what you did. You didn't want patches above that because you needed to know that Mrs. Jones at 29 took the piss or Mr. Marks was all right. Um, he'll pay eventually or that, you know, there's DV at number 22. You had that ingrained knowledge. Now, I think the issue back then was we didn't necessarily have the systems base to take that knowledge and systematize it and enable it for, for use um, in, in a proper manner above and beyond what was in the head of our neighborhoods. And I think what you've seen since the Localism Act of 2011 is a lot of organizations strive for efficiency, partly driven by reduced grant, partly driven for a need to have more cross subsidy, i.e. building private market sales stuff and pushing that back over. Because I mean, broader context 2010 saw a 6% cut in the grant available for new build so there, there is some historic context in terms of pushing the operating model away but fundamentally whether we like it or not we are an extension of the welfare state we were part of the welfare state it's just since the 1980s government has seen fit to discharge its responsibilities to third party actors um, so you need to take basically a, a welfare officer approach to housing management and to have better knowledge ingrained through having more localized teams that costs and that is a problem at the moment because there ain't a lot of cash flowing around so the fact you've seen someone like water housing group take that step is an interesting point and those who've been in the sector well, i've only been in it for nearly, nearly 15 years but you see these cycles come around and this is definitely one that's coming back in of having you know intensive management patches and stuff so well i know of... tom norris um came on to the round table from places for people and i know greg uh greg reed who, who kind of is running things over there said the same thing they when they restructured the restructure was how do we get more bodies on the ground how do we get more boots on the ground to go out and know your patches and that's yeah. how they restructured. And it was almost a reverse restructure rather than going, we need more departments. And so we don't we need more people on the ground going out and doing the job. And that's places for people, which if you go back a number of years, had a really bad reputation. What they're changing and doing over there from speaking with Greg, from speaking with Tom, it's it's market leading, which is what you'd expect a business of that size to be. But it's only a recent change. And so they're having to really go through. Leslie, I'm going to bring you in. Then there's a few more points in the chat I want to raise before we before we wrap up today. Hi, just quickly, um, that, you know, what gets measured matters. And for me, um, for example, are you actually ticking a box? Are you actually wanting to find out the issue? So, for example, I will say, um, when I was a social housing tenant, they would say, were you happy with your repair, right? There was no, it was either a yes or no. There was no, yes, I was happy with the repair, but it took four times for the person to come out and actually fix it. There was no room within that feedback to actually um, give, yes, I was really happy, but blah, 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 and then use it for service improvement. And I also go back to um, what was mentioned in the chat regarding the local authority um, and them um, having access to, you know, either, um, you know, uh, homelessness stuff or, uh, or external stuff. I would think that that would be an opportunity to be able to have, oh, that person might be in trouble if they're accessing this or or they're accessing so 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 there might be some more joined up working and some more information that they might be able to have to then put some stuff in place that so that maybe um you know regular housing associations wouldn't have access to that information so i think that might be an opportunity to explore i'd I, I love that to happen i just know for i know i know my I know. Local authority is burning like a city council <laughs> and i can uh, try i know and get them to talk to each other at the moment is difficult enough never mind our people I, I completely agree that the, again it goes back to that point of the data is there there's a point from katie vincent in the chat we've also found that a vast majority of those that say yes to having made a complaint in the screening and therefore being asked for their satisfaction had not actually made a formal complaint uh, i think that ties in a bit with what leslie said there sometimes it's not a formal complaint it's a point of going well that was good but actually this this could have been improved um and uh george said we've used acuity and have found this as well. A large proportion had not made a formal complaint with us are now doing some work to make sure we're capturing these complaints in places and communication that might have been missed previously. So we are learning. And that's the point. It's willing to learn. 
Yasmin, uh, Tower Hamlets Almo are going in house as of tomorrow. We have all of this to come. It's as 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 Neil mentioned there. It's cyclical. This isn't new. It's just good to see we're moving moving forward. Um, final points, Neil, from you before I kind of wrap up today. Please give a where. What's the one thing people need to do from tomorrow to really, uh, other than maybe be completely honest, which sometimes is difficult with some RPs. Wh- where do people start? Be accountable. Be accountable for your team. Be accountable for the services you provide. Accept the fact that you're not going to get it right all the time. Learn from your mistakes and try and systematize improvements. Don't accept the fact that the status quo needs to remain. You can improve things and you can become a better version of who you are individually, but also as a team. Thank you very, very much. I know we're going to share the presentation around the, the, the recording of this will go up onto YouTube and there'll be one on Spotify as well. I want to say a massive thank you to Neil and everyone who attended. We had 63 people at one point today, which is which is absolutely amazing. One of the busiest roundtables of the year. Uh, as I've mentioned, this is all funded by by my recruitment business. So if you are looking for support, please do reach out because I want to keep this going for free for as long as I possibly can. Next week is a very different tone to the roundtable. Um, and I will say kind of straight off the bat that there's a bit of a trigger warning attached. And if you wish to attend and uh just sit kind of without your video on or anything like that you're welcome um but we have paul bridge and shelly heapy coming on um now they're part of the clive smith foundation and it turns out and i i'm finding out more and more through speaking to them that those who work in housing and construction there's a three times more likely higher uh, three times higher than the national average for suicide for working in these sectors um i can't say i'm thoroughly shocked because of stuff like trauma that goes on and the amount of burnout we have and other things but we're going to be talking about what they're calling the silent pandemic in the sector it's probably gonna be a very very powerful week if you can attend we'd love you to be there if you just want to watch about the recording i completely understand as well um but that's for next week i'm also looking for speakers for next year so i'll no doubt get neil to rope back in for next year but if anyone would like to get involved please let me know for 2024 for now thank you everybody who's been able to join us uh thank you neil for all of your insight today and i look forward to speaking to you all again soon cheers cheers guys